Hello and welcome to another episode of the Uncommon Energy Podcast. My name is Trainer Chip Ritchie, joined here as always by my co-host and friend Azul GG. What's good, Azul? How you doing, bud? I'm doing all right. Uh, been feeling. I'm excited for the next couple weekends coming up. We got some big tournaments, and I'm actually going to be uh, like away the next, you know, ten days starting Friday. I'm going to be staying in Wisconsin between. Milwaukee and NAIC. So I'm a little, I'm a little bit, I'm feeling a little bit burnt out uh, in general with traveling and everything. And then after, I'm kind of excited for just the break in July between sure. NAIC and Worlds. So I'm like looking forward to that a little bit. Feeling pretty burnt out right now, tired. A lot of stuff uh, happening over the last week, a lot of stuff coming up this week. Um, so excited for the events coming up, but also kind of excited for that, the break coming up eventually. How about you, Chip? How was your, how was your weekend? How was your week? Uh, weekend was pretty good. Week was good. Uh, got to watch the Japan National Championships and also the top eight of the Melbourne Regional Championships. I was actually watching along with you on your stream while you were, um, you know, watching it with your Twitch chat and stuff was a lot of fun and got to see the new set in action, which we will definitely be talking about. But yeah, just to mention back to what Azul was just saying, this next couple weeks is a very hectic couple of weeks for the top level competitive Pokemon players. We've got Milwaukee regionals this coming weekend up in Wisconsin. And then just a week later, less than a week later, because it starts on Friday, we will have the North American international championships, which will be the largest Pokemon tournament in, I guess like three years almost since the last NAIC would be the next thing that it was even close to this size. So I'm definitely really excited for this event these next couple weekends. I will be in Milwaukee alongside Azul. Azul will be playing in Milwaukee. I will be casting. So thanks again to Pokemon for bringing me out. It's going to be a lot of fun. But yeah, for today's episode, let's break it down. We are going to be talking about the madness that occurred in melbourne the results of that tournament definitely plenty to talk about there we got a little bit of twitter beef to talk about some pokemon go versus the pokemon tcg drama question mark question mark question mark uh then of course we will have guess that flavor text and then we'll cap off the episode with a milwaukee meta preview talk about our thoughts on the upcoming tournament weekend what we think will do well, what decks we think are poised to do well, what decks we think will not show up, and all of those things. Uh, But yeah, sound good, Azul? You ready to get into it? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah, starting off with Melbourne, first regional uh, with the Astral Radiance cards legal and uh, definitely had a huge impact on the meta (laughs) of the event. Just happened over the weekend, and the, the top eight, or the tournament in general, was uh absolutely uh dominated by palkia all of the top eight decks were palkia basically just two different versions too there wasn't well three of them were the exact same list and then the other five three of them were the turbo version and the other five were the inteleon version but there wasn't a whole lot of variety in the cards played in the inteleon builds i mean there was a little bit but like nothing too ridiculous or nothing like too spicy or like out of the ordinary at all yeah, the Intellian lists that made top eight are definitely pretty similar to what I would say was expected, all within 54-ish cards of one another, just differing a little bit with some text, and they were all texts that people had talked about leading up to the weekend. So, uh, yeah, last week on the cast, we set an over-under for Palkia V-Star and Cut. <laughs> we put it at 2.5, and I think we both took the under, Azul, and... Yeah. Uh, we were both very, very <laughs> wrong as eight Palkia V Star found their way into top eight. And the event was won by Christian Hasbani, who was playing the turbo version of the deck. So we'll break down the two different versions of the deck, how they work, and the differences between how these decks play. Uh, but before that, there has not been an instance in the modern era. This, I think, comes from Pokestats. They said this on Twitter. In the modern era, which most people consider the modern era, um, the 2017 season onwards, like the you know fall of 2016 yeah. onwards, because that's when cash got added to the game. Whenever they started paying the the regional winners up. five grand, um, so yeah, ever since then is kind of like considered the modern era of the game. And since that time, there has never been a tournament that all eight decks were top eight, or not all eight decks in top <laughs> eight. Yeah, whatever. 
be quiet, don't laugh at me. <laughs> All eight decks in the top eight were the same deck. Now, I think it's maybe happened in the history, I'm sure, at some point along the way, like Guard of War in 2008, whenever that deck yeah. was super dominant, I'm sure there was a time where that was all eight spots in top eight. But even still, I mean, this is just eight, this is just something that doesn't happen. And why? What? So this is something that doesn't happen. How did it happen this weekend in Australia? Um, I mean, so I think, and even before, like a couple of years ago, I don't think this would have happened in Australia. But I think in general with the game, like testing groups have become more of a thing and having more impact on the game like as of you know like four or five years ago and what we see in australia specifically is their tournaments are smaller <clears throat> is one thing right so i mean th their top players are still top players right it's not to say that their top players in the world aren't world-class top level players henry brand literally won worlds of course and you know <laughs> they have multiple like players who have like top ICs and all that stuff you know so it's just that when you take so many of the good players and then they all play the exact same deck, um, and that's what we really see with the group of like Kaiwen, Brent, Natalie, uh, and so on, because uh, they kind of dominated their the other regional that Natalie won as well. That's going to have an impact on it for sure. Um, and two, I mean, two of they played. I mean, Kaiwen and, and Christian literally played a mirror match in the finals, which does not happen very often. No, um, even when you have these groups of great players playing the exact same list and even multiple making top eight getting that mirror match in the finals is really really hard we've only seen that like a couple times the only one other one i remember um i was close to doing it in knoxville with danny but then xander and i forget who else uh played sb garb at portland regionals when lucario came out um and they had a they had a mirror match in that final that's like it's very rare that same 60 mirror i don't even know if they're playing the same 60 but that's like I one of the times the only time but like it very rarely happens to, to begin with. But I mean, I think that's an impact. Um, maybe people not respecting Palkia as much as they should and thinking that their decks stood up fine. Like people still playing stuff like Arceus and Teleon or Mew players not really being as prepared for it. Um, or Palkia maybe is just really that ridiculously good. Um, and that's why we saw eight of them in the top eight. But it was pretty close. Like there was like the next the next couple decks in top 16, some of them were on winning ends. Uh, I know Natalie tied the win in. I'm not sure what Natalie played up against. So if Natalie had lost, maybe that deck would have made it into top eight. So I think it's a little bit of an anomaly, a little bit of all the best players in Australia choosing, or most of the best players in Australia choosing to play Palkia. A little bit of like the, like the testing group thing going on. Like I said, if they're all going to bring Palkia and they're all the best players in Australia, I mean, it doing really well isn't a surprise. All, into, all, all eight being Palkia, I think it might just be a little bit of an anomaly. Like, I don't think, I think if you ran the same tournament again, I don't think you'd have eight Palkia in top eight if you play, if everyone played the exact same decks right yeah probably not but honestly maybe just because like you said <laughs> the, the events there's just not as many players it was about 200 i think 198 is the exact count yeah. sorry 195 looking at it right now yeah. is the biggest, exact uh, count biggest regional in australia as well but i think by someone tweeted out by 25 percent, so quite a big that's yes. quite a big uptick for sure especially like the other ones were pretty close the first two regionals they had were pretty close to the numbers of the regionals they had had previously in the same areas and then this one just like seemed to shoot way up which is great because the game's game's growing over there yeah and i i mean i comparing this to what we've seen from the north american regionals so far this year kind of the like best large testing group that we've seen do really well is like the Isaiah Bradner, Rahul Reddy, John Ng, uh, Sam Chin group. I don't know if I'm Xander. missing anyone else in there. Xander as well. Yeah. He hasn't been to all the regionals. I don't think Justin Bakari as well, but like that kind of crew, they always play the same 60 and we've seen several regionals where they've all made day two, but our tournaments yeah. are just so much bigger. They're there's more rounds in day two, right? So there's more opportunity yeah. for variants or bad matchups and stuff to pop up. And this Palkia deck is not without its bad matchups, which we can talk about when we get into it um, a little bit deeper. But whenever you're only playing eight or nine or what what is eight rounds of Swiss day one, cutting straight it's to eight, a top yeah. eight yeah. is a big difference of playing nine rounds into five more rounds into top eight. There's just more chances for yeah. things to break up. And this is not at all discrediting any of the Australian players, we think all the Australian players, you know, that have made, t uh, have won these tournaments are like, you know, world-class players. We've said time and time oh, again. Yeah. Uh, so they're definitely qualified. And that is a huge aspect as to why they are dominating and doing so well at these events because they are the best in the country. But 
is a big difference. Uh, and whenever it's a smaller field and you have a higher concentration of these players, it's really not that big of a surprise to see three out of five people in a testing group make top eight. Yeah, for sure. It definitely has like definitely an impact on it as well. But yeah, I mean, yeah, like I think there's a couple different factors that went into why there was. Uh, and then, of course, Henry Brand as well chose to play Palkia, made top eight. No one's surprised that Henry's in top eight. And Henry chose to play Palkia. So Henry being in top eight with a Palkia deck, like, yeah, I mean, I mean, and also <laughs> it's it's the new big card and it's obviously very yeah. powerful. So I think people were excited to try the new card. I was thinking that card availability could theoretically be an issue was not a problem <laughs> for uh, these players. It seems as eight of them did make it into top eight. So like you mentioned, two different versions of the deck. We've got the turbo build with the Mew from Celebrations. It's mysterious tail ability, letting you look at the top six cards of your deck, putting an item card you find there into your hand. And then combining that with the new Trekking Shoes card, which lets you look at the top card of your deck, and then you can choose to either discard that card or put it into your hand. And then if you choose to discard the card, you put the next card from the top of your deck into your hand. So it can let you see two cards potentially. So it's just really turbo trying to fly through the deck. This type of engine was popularized by Reggie Nichiguchi, I believe is their name, uh, who got... Mm -hmm first place at a big online event a couple uh like last week with the dialga deck and that was their inspiration for this list i believe brent tonison is the one who's credited for kind of applying that engine to the palkia list and they determined it was good enough and so the whole group played it for this tournament and christian hasbani ends up taking down the tournament i believe christian's first regionals win i think he got second place at a regionals a couple seasons ago but got the first win here so congratulations to christian um very well deserved and played against the same 60 in the finals like you mentioned who was uh kaiwin playing it yeah brent tonison got top eight and then natalie miller got top 16 with it yeah, yeah. And uh, the finals was not, <laughs> it was pretty one sided. Kaiwin did, Kaiwin like game one drew really bad, and then game two prized both V stars. We've had um, some so. pretty disappointing finals so far this year. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if we think about EYC, them. like, like in EYC, you got to like see all three the juniors, seniors, and masters, and it was just like a sweep one side. <laughs> yeah. And this one wasn't great either. Um, I guess like the I mean the I mean one of the ones that stands out to me was the New Jersey regionals like Tor like it was a tough matchup for Tor but he's putting up a fight or uh Toronto Vancouver. oh no no or, uh, Vancouver, Toronto, Vancouver, yeah, Vancouver, Vancouver 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 yeah but Tor was like putting up a fight the whole time and like had outs and like it didn't really come together I don't but know, like, man I think that one was pretty much a wash for Tor <laughs> pretty early on it was just a tough matchup know. it seemed like there were some routes there were some routes but no yeah I guess I guess you're right and also yeah Peter in the New Jersey finals not yep. really putting yep. it together um. So, yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess there has been some pretty disappointing finals. I can't remember all of them. Ian, but, Ian um, Robb versus Isaiah was a pretty decent set. It wasn't, like, outstanding, I don't think, but, you know, both players played very well. It just seemed yeah. like Ian drew a little bit better. I think if I remember correctly, uh, Isaiah didn't draw the best in Game 3. I'm pretty sure yeah. that's what happened, which it I always also, feels bad to see a tournament end like that, but it's Pokemon, yeah. right? Drew versus Finn as well was a really lopsided matchup. That was yeah. <laughs> that one was yeah. One maybe was you're tough. right. Maybe the finals have not been too great. I guess overall, to be honest, maybe that's a little bit of the format. Maybe that just kind of is uh you know just some unfortunate draws. I mean, there's there's always some there's good games still for sure. But yeah, the finals in general have been pretty rough. Maybe NAIC and Worlds uh, or Milwaukee will be uh we'll, we'll get some better games in the finals hopefully for the for the stream because it is like that's, that's also like a, kind of like one of the things about like the stream aspect of streaming the card game like it's already hard to get viewers to watch like people who don't play the card game to watch a card game like in the stream and then when the games just aren't very good as well like it's yeah it's just that much worse you know what I'm saying like it's already hard to get people like people showing up to watch the video game stream it's like easy because like so many people play it and it's not as hard to like follow along but get people to watch trading card games and then have like it be so one-sided is like i don't know if people are coming back to watch another trading card game <laughs> tournament when it's so when the finals are so poor well yeah hopefully we'll get some better ones for milwaukee this weekend and then at naic the following weekend so let's let's break down this turbo list and talk exactly about how this deck works for anyone who has not seen it yet very similar to the ability zard turbo welder decks from the 2019 to 2020 season if you are familiar with that kind of time frame. And the way it works is you just have the four Mew, uh, the shoes, the nets, the air balloons. You just kind of maneuver between a couple of Mews, get the pieces you need, scoop up net reset, use another Mew. 
Just try to get through the deck as quickly as possible. Set up whatever your optimal attacker is. Most of the time, of course, it will be the Origin Form Palkia V-Star. You got a couple other options in there with the Suicune and the Starmie. And then uh, I think usually going first or going second, it feels like most of the time they want to end their turn with the um, Diancy in the active spot so that they can hide behind it until they're set up and ready to start attacking. It seems like kind of the general strat of this deck from what I've seen. Uh, I mean, when you go first, you don't really need to hide behind it. I mean, at all. You usually want, like, double Muse in play if you're opponent can get, like, a one knockout. Fair, yeah. Muse in it. But, yeah, going second, like, that's why the Diancies are there. So, it's, like, the deck is, like, basically built. You have, like, just enough cards or maybe a little bit extra. You don't really need four bosses' orders. But, like, finding the bosses' orders can be pretty tough. The deck actually doesn't, like, deck out. Like, you don't actually... It feels like you don't actually deck out with the deck very often. But you get low enough that you see enough of your options that you'll get all the cards you need. But it's actually... The deck doesn't feel like it ever actually decks out. Yeah, it seems like I often. always... When I when I was watching the top eight stream, anyone playing this list had, like, 12 cards in their hand by turn, yeah. the end of turn two, it <laughs> felt like. Like, they were just seeing a bunch of cards. They're using that Radiant Greninja, concealed cards, drawing extra cards, scoop up net, concealed cards once again. Um, of course, you can get all those energies back right away with the Star Portal of Origin Form Palkia. And you can draw car more cards with Crobat. You can find those boss's orders with the Trekking Shoes or the Luminion V that they played as well to get access to it at the right key turns. And the only supporters in this list, you mentioned the four boss's orders, and the only other option is two copies of Melanie. So really yep. reminiscent of Welder because that was, uh, I mean, I guess Welder played four Welders. These guys are just like, you know what? Subspace Swell, so good. Or Star Portal, excuse me, so good. We just need the two copies of Melanie. Yeah, sometimes you need a little bit extra. Also, let's say like, it's like turn one attack with uh, Suicune, which can be nice in some scenarios. Turn one attack with Suicune when you go second. Um, usually you're pushing a Diancie, or just like if they don't even have a threat on board, you can just like pass um, with like a Mew in the active or whatever, and then just take the initiative next turn with a boss's orders. So, but the Melanie are nice, yeah, because you potentially to get the grasp the early initiative uh, with a with a Suicune, uh, or you can you know just get some ener extra energy in play on your first turn going second, just like get some extra cards as well. Like just like Melanie to a Palkia, throw up a Diancie and Pash. Just like getting that little bit of extra energy in play is really, really nice. So yeah. And then from there, you're just trying to, trying to use boss a lot or trying to look for a 1k on the active and then chase down two prize Pokemon pretty much the whole game. Um, and draw as many, yeah, the shoes, the Muse, the Radiant Greninja. And yeah, and that's almost, yeah, the Nets get used more on the Radiant Greninja than like the Muse. <laughs> yeah, it uh, feels like it. I guess the, sometimes you need Punkaboo for some paths, but yeah, usually the ninja just like and with Bucket. And that's why I actually like when you compare this to kind of like uh, the original build with the Dialga, like Bucket is such a huge deal to like generate card value with Greninja because like in the Dialga build, you were like, okay, discard, like use Scoop of Net to reset the Greninja and then discard an energy. So you're getting rid of two cards to draw two cards. But with Bucket, you get two cards in the hand, discard one, get another two cards, then you net reset, draw two two more cards and then if you get another bucket that creates more cards so just like card value being generated out of like you can actually generate card value because of bucket when you compare it to like some of the other ways people are playing this turbo engine now so yeah it, it feels like the perfect fit for it it's kind of just like getting card advantage getting more cards in your hand which card advantage is not really a thing in pokemon compared to other yeah. card games but in this instance it kind of is because getting the extra energies lets you use the greninja more and more uh um, yeah throughout the game and like pre following turns and stuff like that so uh, especially when uh one thing i noticed like no one's playing marnie like even yeah. in the the inteleon builds like some people play one marnie but using marnie feels so bad <laughs> in like palkia yeah. inteleon like you want to be bossing or you want to be uh you know doing something a little bit more aggressive like marnie just does not feel like a good supporter to play right now um, and this this kind of turbo engine kind of takes advantage of that, especially like I said, with the card generation from the buckets. Like you build with a big hand, no one marnies you. Sure, on the rock sand turn, you're gonna get rock sand probably, but like by then you've hopefully played your deck into a position where uh the rock sand doesn't feel too bad and you can hopefully deal with whatever the rock sand does to you. But um yeah, I don't know. It's just uh you know, Marnie path and also path, like a path, like they have the punkaboo, um, but that's like to deal with like you know, that one of maybe two of path. But, you know, if we see a quad path, quad Marnie deck, like, I don't feel, kind of feels like the time for maybe something like that to come back to punish these these turbo decks. Yeah, but the problem with that, like, it obviously would be solid, but you're still going to be getting hit pretty hard as long as they can yeah. set up. Because they still get a turn to use their abilities, so they can still get a turn to get an energy attachment onto Palkia. And even if you have a low bench and you're just Marnieing pathing with something with high HP, 
you're still getting hit pretty hard. So then you got to, <laughs> and then you're relying on playing things like, I mean, it's probably like one of these healing decks. Like the way you're talking about is making me think of something like Stone Jorner or like Drake Azult, <laughs> stuff like that. that. <laughs> I mean, I don't Drake know. Drake Azult, though, that sounds kind of lit, actually. Drake Azult probably does a great job at beating Origin Form Palkia and not much else, if I had to guess. If we're being Paul that's a pretty good spot to be, to be honest. Reasonable, reasonable. Yeah, reasonable. But I mean, that's one, one, the, uh, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Oh, go, 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 go. I was going to say that's the turbo version of the deck, but there was another version that was really popular and kind of the more standard yeah. way to play the deck from what we have seen is the Intellian build. We've got five of those in the top eight. Of course, Henry Brand did make top eight as well, the 2019 world champion. Playing just kind of the more... What this is what people have been playing online is the yeah. you know, Intellian list with the, um, you know, just straightforward attack with Palkia, and then some of these lists have some text in here, like some of them have the Starmy, some of them have Crobat, some of them have Ice Q, lots of little variations between the decks. But like I said at the beginning, it feels like they're all within like they're like the same 54, 55 ish cards. Yeah, they're all really, really close. And actually, more so than the turbo version, which makes... It's that it's the fact that five of these were in cut alongside, you know, like we said, that like it is something to, like, kind group, of... Yeah. That, alongside that test. And it is something to, like, bring up and talk about for sure. I don't want to, like, only talk... But, like, you know, that testing group, those players playing together constantly, you know, is going to factor into these results in Australia for sure. We've seen it consistently now, so... Um, like it's almost irrelevant because they were always going to bring a good deck. So, I mean, they could have showed up with Mew if they thought that that was good enough to go in Spout and We could have seen like a similar result where it's like three of them in top eight. How well they would have done, who knows? But like, it's almost like the fact that there was also five Inteleon Palkias that like makes me think, is Palkia just broken? Is it just <laughs> insanely good? Like you have this really good testing group. They brought Palkia. Okay, they did well. Like that's not a surprise. But then you just have the other five people in top eight we're also just all Palkia and Tellian. They're all Palkia They're all decks. different lists, like not not yeah. not the same testing group, not the same 60 from any of these other five players. Yeah. So that that's what makes me more think, okay, is Palkia just kind of just kind of broken? Like it's kind of crazy that there is that top 8 and that these other five players as well like all showed up, did really well with Palkia and it just like is the top 8. Like I said, you look at the top 16 and you know, the Mew, uh Jack Underwood had a really really cool deck and we'll talk about that later, but like you know, the other other decks that were played and did well in the tournament, they weren't far from top 8. You know, there's like no. there's like three Mews in top 16 and stuff like that. Uh there's a G Turbo Gengar like the, the the rest of the decks weren't far from top 8, right? Um but I mean it's Palky is kind of scary. We saw like there was a Japanese tournament over the weekend as well, like four of the top 5 were Palkia. <laughs> like I don't know. It's uh, definitely makes you think that Palkia is uh, it's, it's kind of almost feels like it's already established itself as the BDIF, the best deck in the format. And hopefully not by far, but it almost feels like by far. So let's break down some of the differences between these lists. Like I said, same 54 ish cards, but some yeah. of the differences, some of them played Starmy V, some of them played Leon, Roxanne was included in a couple of them. Cross Switcher was played, I think, by at least one of the players. Echo yeah, and Horn was an inclusion we saw. Tool Jammer was something some people played, others did not. And then the Ice Q as well, something else I mentioned. A little tech that we've seen pop up. I feel like Ice Q is what? Mostly for the Reggie Gigas matchup uh, for the yeah, most part. Miltank Blissey as well. I think it. Yeah, sure. Kinda, I think it's actually just. I think it's better against Miltank Blissey than the Reggie. The, uh, the, the Reggie decks are trying to tech for the SQ and can like beat it now, but. Um, I don't think Bill Tank Blissey has an answer to uh, SQ. So you you just beat that matchup for sure, I think. Um, so but yeah, there's a, a, a little tech that we saw. I mean, so between all of these different, you know, the like six or so cards, yeah. seven or six cards I just listed there, if there was three of yours that were your favorite, which which three of those that I listed do you think you would be play playing? For me, I know one of them would probably be the Roxanne. I saw that was in Henry Brand's list. I'm definitely a big fan of the Roxanne, just the potential to be able to come back with the, the Roxanne path, specifically against something like Mew, I think is very, very strong, um, though it is very situational. But that's where, you know, you have the Intellion engine to get you those pieces at that exact situation, right? I think all of them played Roxanne, didn't they? I think everyone I don't think played so. Roxanne. No, I don't think the third I'm place list sure. did. The third place check, list has but... it. I, I will double check. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they all have Roxanne um so i don't know if we want to add that to our list of of things yeah i think it's just kind of become a staple i wasn't running it for a while in my build but i think there is just too many situations where it just kind of 
it's for that late game comeback potential from a card like i think it's just uh okay confirmed it's too good not to include all of them did play that scene, so that is my all right, mistake. So, <laughs> so let's let's pick two let's pick two of the remaining uh six or so different cards well, I hey listen pick, it's uh, a good thing that the one i picked was the one that they all already played right? <laughs> out of those i would pick um i think i'd pick cross cross switcher and tool jammer tool jammer i think should just be a staple at this point anyone who's not playing tool jammer Probably hasn't played with it yet, but the card's pretty crazy in Palkian. Just the way it kind of lines up against so many different situations. So Tool Jammer for sure. And then probably Cross Switchers. If people are going to be doing the Diancy thing, like uh, having a way to get around... Um, having a way to get around it is just... Uh, yeah. I, just really, really good. Like if people are going to be doing this turbo thing where they're all hiding behind Diancy for a turn, like two Cross Switchers kind of solves it. You could do the escape rope like uh, Henry did. Henry did play one escape rope. So you either force him to find two Diancy or you just have the answer of like escape rope KO what they send up or escape rope, you know, and then boss afterwards. Um, so so I guess something like that uh, for sure. And then, yeah, Jammer, Jammer, you should be playing Jammer. If you're not rocking the Jammer, start jamming. So you didn't choose Starmie or Ice Q. Do you not think that either of those cards is really worth playing? I'm not a huge fan of the Starmie, I don't think right yeah. now, because I think if your opponent knows that you play it, um, it's going to be hard for you to ever utilize it. It's like, it'll be something that maybe will win you one game in a best of three, um, like early rounds and stuff, but kind of once people know that they play it or maybe just knowing that the threat of it could exist, people like try to play around it a little bit. Right. Yeah. I think it's like good against like Lissy and Duraladon Arceus. It's good against Arceus, I guess if they Trinity Nova, but like, and that's maybe like, that's like another thing. It's like, why does why our case is like, why does that? Why does there have to be this random answer? Like, if our case gets popular, our 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 Paul K. Dexans be like, okay, I'll play the star. Like, because it's like, <laughs> yeah, you true. can just Trinity it over for one, but that feels so bad. True. Um, and sometimes if you're ahead on the price trade as our case, you can bait out the star and be like, all right, go ahead, bring it up. I'll knock it out with my Trinity Nova with the triple basic. Uh, Arceus follow up, but um, yeah, like if Arceus decks ever get like popular and you want that tech for it, like Starmie kind of kind of puts them in their place i feel like pretty pretty aggressively so but uh yeah i think right now it's just not enough reasons like paul Kale already has outs to deal with all the things that starmy could deal with and i guess it, but if anything ever pops up it's like a really cool card to all of a sudden include like the sq right like sq mm -hmm. if we'll see miltank got really popular like the sq but uh i don't think it really quite answers the like the reggie decks are just like playing like the escape ropes and the bosses and stuff like that so they have like they're playing the answers for the sq and sq is like super slow it's not now he's not taking a knockout every time it swings and 70 damage and then if they just net the they can if they play the bad lucky they can like net loop for a little while while they find their combo so like sq does not seem to be cutting it i don't think right now but um maybe in the future so we've got two versions of the deck the turbo list and the intellian version which would you call your preference i think the turbo list is going to be a little bit more consistent and has a higher burst potential, right? Obviously, with its turbo name, right? It's a little more powerful, <laughs> maybe. But the um, the Intellian version, you can do a little bit more with. Like, you can tech a little bit more. You can't really play cross switchers with the turbo version of the deck. It doesn't feel like you're just not going to... I mean, you've got the Mew, I guess, to find them. But, um, you know, you've got the trekking shoes as well. So it's like you're just going to maybe shoes into your cross switchers at a bad time, something like that. Who knows? Um, I don't know. What are your thoughts between the two versions? Uh, I think I definitely prefer the Inteleon version. I don't think the the turbo version is <clears throat> like leaps and bounds ahead of it. In some situations, in some matchups, it's better. But I think actually like head to head Inteleon, I think is like slightly favored um, just a bit as long as you like. I mean, one thing that we didn't see from any of the uh, Australian and Italian lists was Battle VIP Pass, and they just you got to get your Palkias out there in I think so a many matches. Amount of them did and, play yeah. Battle VIP Pass. Did they? Maybe or I. Maybe several I. Several of them did for sure. Okay, maybe I'm. Maybe the ones I just saw on stream, I never saw a Battle VIP Pass. That well, might be yeah. It. Let's see. Agnes didn't play it. I think. Callum. No, Callum didn't I, have I, it I either. Maybe it was the lower top eight ones, like. Let's look at Lewis. Had the one okay, yeah. battle VIP pass. Yeah, and so did uh, Max. so did Max. Okay, okay. Yeah. So a couple of them did, but I but think the, that's the higher uh, finishing ones did not. Yeah, I think that's like a pretty important card to like, like you just need to get Palkia V's in play, and like battle VIP pass gets basic Pokemon in play. Yeah, but are we really just um, playing one? Is like one additional out to get guys in play? <laughs> 
I mean, I, I, I like two of them right now. And, like, the card is so good, I would maybe go up to a higher count. But, like, two of them with some Iritas, like, you're finding it turn one pretty consistently. Uh, and if you're not finding it, you're finding other stuff. So hopefully that's your basic Pokemon, right? So Yeah, I was also um, talking about the Intellian l versions. Like, I know Arita's been obviously very popular, but I was just a little surprised that it was, like, you know, all of the lists were playing multiple Arita. To me, yeah. this card is just, like... I would almost <laughs> always rather just play a research. I feel like, man, the times I see people play this card. I don't know. You have like, I, I played it quite a bit now. You just have those other cards in your hand that are good. So if you combo those with the cards you get off the Irita, it just kind of works. Sure. Um, and then it lets you play stuff like the battle VIP pass. So your turn one is Irita to literally get your whole squad. Um, and then you're just kind of chilling. So um, yeah, I don't know. Like it definitely feels pretty good so far like I, that's what i thought too when i first read it. i was like i'm no there's no way i'm playing this card when i could play a research but the more i played it it's like you're basically doing what the research would have done but uh you know you're potentially not discarding your roxanne for the late game or one of your cross switchers um you're just playing the irita getting the cards you would you would want to find off the research anyways and then you just put those in play and then you're you're kind of just chilling from there like, especially if you can find your basics early with like battle vip passes um and, you know you're not getting bossed out on turn two yeah. Uh, which is what we saw happening kind of when the turbo build went up against some of the the more aggressive builds. Um, and like, oh, another thing I want to say, like one of the advantages, specifically at this tournament for the turbo build, is no one knew what they were playing. So I saw multiple people playing around like Echoing Horn, it seemed like, when they were going up against, you know, Brent uh, and Christian and stuff. And then, I mean, there was no Echoing Horn. So <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> they didn't play Echoing Horn. So now that it's a little bit more known of what could be in the list, you know, that'll definitely help. I mean, people could add Echoing Horn, of course, but that's where the deck starts to lose some of its turbo factor once you start playing these cards that aren't turbo, right? So, um, but mm -hmm. I think I think it's the turbo so, build is so good. I definitely just like like the Intellion a little bit more. What about you? Have you had a chance to play much with either? You said you played with the turbo one a bit, right? Yeah, I've played with both a little bit. Not, I don't think as much as you have quite yet. But yeah, I mean, I, they're both very strong. Um, I would probably lean a little bit more towards the turbo deck because I just like those styles of decks a little bit more yeah. personally. Um, though I recognize, you know, Intellian is one of the most powerful s search engines in the history of the game. So, uh, you know, putting that in the right player's hands, very, very good. Um, I just kind of like, you know, I like playing trekking shoes when I can, because I like <laughs> to see a bunch of cards, you know, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, no, it's definitely a ton of fun and, um, we'll see like what else people can do with that engine for sure. But, you know, it's still, it, uh, they're both good. Um, they like said now that the people know about the turbo a little bit more, know what it's kind of bringing, Definitely going to be uh, the advantage isn't there of just having it go in there blind. Of course, like I said, you don't have to play the exact same 60 that was played at Melbourne, but uh, it's a pretty good 60. Um, and yeah, if you add too many cards that aren't turbo, you're going to start to be, you know, you may as well be playing Italian at some point. Yeah, I guess one more thing I'll mention on the like Arita versus research discussion. Um, so, so like um, the big comparison for me, I guess, would be like looking back to Karina from the 20. Yeah, I hated that 15, card. <laughs> 2016 time frame. And it was like a pretty popular card. It was played in Don fan. It was played in like Lucario bats and stuff like that. Groudon. Yeah, Groudon as well. Um, but I mean, stuff like Groudon, it's like it's a slower deck. So you can take the yeah. turn to just go get your Groudon and guarantee it. Right. Don fan. It's like it gets you everything you need. Pretty much your um don fan piece and then a robo sub or an inner like letter for energy whatever it is to or focus sash whatever piece um but like just the way the game is right now games are over in five turns at most four to five turns for the most part so you really just need one research sometimes in the early game and you sometimes <laughs> don't even need it it's like there's only one turn you're going to be able to play research arita gets you that other setup piece and then in, after that you're going to probably boss or roxanne or boss again yeah. right uh the game just doesn't last long enough for you to really need to play four research in your deck it feels like right now at least in an intellian deck yeah, definitely. Yeah. And most of the lists play the one research. Some had Marnie, I think. Henry's list had a Marnie. I saw a couple other Marnies, I think. I'm yeah, not Max sure. Had but yeah. Marnie as well. I'm looking at I've got their list pulled up right now. Yeah, and then most had like the one of research. And then you have like a Melanie as well when you need some energy extra energy acceleration. And you get to draw a couple cards there as well. So you have, yeah, a couple different outs. And then the yeah, Rita kind of fills in the spots where it's like, well, I'm KOing their active, uh, or I'm hitting their active. I'm not gonna be able to get a one and KO this turn. 
let's just set up or let's get the pieces to even do that to begin with and just be comfortable with that for the turn. So, and then it fills in like your early game. It just fills in so many spots. I feel like where it just like does what you need to do or does exactly what you want to do on the turn. And then you kind of, uh, you know, can pick it up from there for sure. So we've talked plenty about Palkia, but there were some other interesting decks as well that got the top 16 at Melbourne, not any others in top eight, unfortunately, but <laughs> you know, all these players were just probably about one win away or so from making it into top 16. So let's just go through the other 16 players or the other eight players real quick. And then we can talk about the deck. So Jack Underwood was playing a, water box deck with frost moth and intellium we're definitely going to talk about this a little bit we've got tibor who was playing the turbo gengar deck so gengar v max with that mu celebrations turbo engine with the trekking shoes we've got three players in a row 11th 12th and 13th place all on the mu v max so mu still had a pretty solid weekend all of these players yeah. once again just like one went away from making cut um natalie miller getting 14th place with the turbo palkia we've got sky godfrey with the rapid strike intellion and then alfred yang closing it out with the origin form palkia v star with intellion so let's start with ninth place jack underwood we were talking before the cast started and you are pretty uh hype on this deck you think it's really cool yeah yeah, well, I mean, I guess like the coolest part of it is the uh, the Lapras. I didn't even know this card existed, but the Lapras with the uh, Raging Freeze. If any of your Pokemon were knocked out by damage from an attack uh, from one of your from an attack from your opponent's Pokemon during your their last turn, your opponent's active Pokemon is now paralyzed for water, water, colorless. Uh, so it does 110 damage, um, and then they're paralyzed if one of your Pokemon were knocked out last turn. There's not a lot of Switch cards in the format, not like in the Palkia decks. No one's really playing Switch cards, um, and then you play. Uh, so it only does 110, and it's a kind of can be a little bit awkward to have a follow up because if you like paralyze a two prizer and then follow up with the two prizer, you're kind of feeding them a two prizer, which it feels like you don't want to do. But with like the choice belt, you can like raging freeze for uh, 140 and 140, and that two it KOs like all V stars, right? So and you could also like up against a V Max, paralyze them, and then clean up with like a Crabominal or the Starmie. Uh, or if you get like enough quick shootings off, then you can clean up with an aqua bullet or just raging freeze with enough quick shootings, I guess is also possible. But yeah, the Lapras is super sick for sure. That I didn't know that card existed. Um, and the rest of it, it doesn't even really look like you have <laughs> like attacking options, but Radiant Greninja is one of your main attackers. And there's the Crabominable V, which we've seen a couple times in some janky decks before with the Destroyer Punch 90 plus 60 for each damage counter on your opponent's active. Uh, for water water colorless and then the star me of course we talked about that 50 for each energy attached to your opponent's pokemon uh, for water water so not very many attackers but there's some nesses in there so you re reuse a lot of them and then you also attack with aqua bullet and teleon quite a bit as well so uh really cool deck the lapras really stood out to me i didn't seen that before and i think that's just like with so few switch cards in the format you're kind of abusing that uh you know finding find like a little bit of a hole or a gap in the in the format where people aren't really playing those uh those cards yeah, I, when I did my set review for Brilliant Stars, I actually wrote about the Lapras. I still gave it a one out of five, but anytime <laughs> a card auto paralyzes, it is always worth keeping in mind. Paralysis is the strongest status condition in the game because it's the yeah. only one of all the status conditions that guarantees your opponent won't attack, provided they don't play something like a switch or an escape rope, something like that. It forces them to do something. Whereas something like sleep, they can always just flip heads. And of course, poison, burn, confuse, you can always try to just attack through any of those. But yeah, this deck is really cool. Uses the Intellion engine, of course, and then you power up all these different water attackers with Frost Moth, the Ice Dance ability to throw some water energies onto your benched water Pokemon. Definitely a really cool deck. I think that we can definitely see um people like try to take this list and innovate and do similar type things so this yep. archetype i think we could still see a little bit more from i don't know that it's like tier one quality by any means but it's definitely a solid enough deck and jack certainly proved that by getting ninth place at this regionals yeah definitely and also the heavy ball is like really really good in that one as well um, yeah with all these different <laughs> one of attackers heavy ball is just a pretty good card a lot of the palkias were playing yeah. it as well it, it's in the turbo list right yeah there's there's i think they have two copies two of, of the card yeah um or one copy of the card heavy ball, i think i heard you talking about it on your stream it's just kind of like a fifth quick ball a lot of the time it can uh, be yeah because you play so many pokemon you just in the early game you want to get pokemon in play and it's just so likely you're going to prize some basic that you want to get down. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's definitely one of the coolest, if not maybe the coolest card from the from the set. Um, <clears throat> and then we saw another another deck taking advantage of the the turbo engine tenth place, the uh, Gengar, actually Gengar V Max with the turbo engine, which uh, it it feels a little awkward. It feels like unnecessary to play Gengar in here, but I mean it worked for them. They got tenth place. They basically and they they were like more. They were a lot closer to what um, Rigi had played with the Dialga initially. They still have the cross switchers in there and stuff like that. But um, I'm not sure that Gengar is gonna like continue to be uh, to be uh, to be a deck in this turbo kind of build. I think there's potential for Gengar in general, but the turbo build kind of feels out of place with it to, to me. Well, I think I'm. I mean, Gengar does seem solid because it's got 320 HP, so Palkia can't one hit KO it unless they get some Leons or quick shootings or stuff. And you also don't need a full bench with this deck necessarily yeah. with the turbo build. You're probably going to be benching three or four things at minimum. You can try to avoid the fifth sometimes though, when it's necessary. Um, and it one hit KOs Palkia with a choice belt. It also one hit KOs Arceus V star. So there's definitely a lot of upside for the Gengar deck. Um, it is a little higher maintenance though. You do need three energies on it. You can of course supplement that with the dark patch which was reprinted in Astro Radiance. So yeah, I think this deck is really cool. You've also got other attackers in here, like the Hoopa can just take quick prizes on, um, can take quick prizes on Sobbles or Deancey's even, or Muse, which is definitely becoming a more popular thing as well. <laughs> um, you got Galarian Moltres as like a late game sweeping option potentially. And Avery as well, and Marnie as kind of the support options. You don't have to play Melanie with this deck. You can uh, afford to play some other cards. And I actually think Avery is a pretty good card right now in the meta because these turbo builds love to have a pretty big bench. Yeah, it's all right. I think it's like not. I don't even like even like up against like well, the turbo builds like to have a bench, but like they're just gonna discard their Crobats if you like Avery them. I guess they that's also fair have too. like. They have like two attackers and a Greninja is all they want to keep around. So like if you Avery them, you're just kind of helping them most of the time, I feel like, and hurting yourself. Um, but it's a little bit better against uh, Inteleon, Inteleon Palkia. Builds, but even so, then, yeah. I feel like it's not even that good against Inteleon Palkia for like when I played it against them or or been hit by an Avery. It's like, okay, I'll just card like a, you know, a Sobble and a Palkia, but I still have two Palkias and some Sobbles. Like, because um, the Palkia is just like so low maintenance and you always have your ability to kind of set you up initially and leave you in a spot where you don't need very much to follow up or to bail you out of any situation where all of a sudden it's looking a little bit uh hairy so yeah but it's it's i mean gigas it gets it's it gets in there against gigas so like it, it's solid it's like not there's like i feel like there's almost not anything better than avery to play to be honest sometimes like avery's like well in these kind of turbo-ish decks it's like i just kind of want to draw three bird keeper especially with gengar to reset the attack i think there could be some potential for bird keeper yeah, over, over avery true. but and with um, Mew Avery's as well, to bad. use multiple Mysterious Tales as well. There's yeah. like that benefit, potentially. Um, so yeah, I think this deck is definitely cool. I would agree with you, though, that Palkia is probably still just the best way to play this engine. We didn't yeah. see any Dialgas in Top 16, which was obviously the way that this deck, this engine, kind of got popularized last week. Um, were you surprised to not see any Dialgas making a deep run at this one? Not really. I kind of talked about it like as being well, I, thinking back to we picked we both picked Radiant Pokemon to do well and you picked Halucha, I picked uh Heatran. Okay. But... <laughs> picking Heatran was definitely a way bigger throw than picking Halucha. Well though. no, yeah. No, I'm just like it was funny that it was yeah, like yeah. not even it was just eight Greninja. <laughs> I don't even think there's a uh Halucha yeah. in top sixteen at all. <laughs> like Yeah, there isn't actually. There probably is not. It's just all Greninjas or nothing if you're playing Mew, right? Yeah. And Sky did not play any Radiant Pokemon as well in their Intellion deck. Oh, is that the tech for the the Mew Mirrors to play a Halucha so you one hit KO the other? Oh, <laughs> keep it on the DL, bro. <laughs> Put a Tool Jammer on your Mew to stop them from one hit KOing you, and then you Halucha to one hit. Oh, well, that's she... definitely just no one leaked. No one leaked. That's. De <laughs> I think you would still probably play Choice Belt, but well. Oh, the jammy's pretty good against Palkia. You shot off their choice belt so they don't want to kill you. Are we Mew? really prioritizing saying. the Mew Mirror right now, though? Or are we prioritizing no, Palkia not. a little bit more? <laughs> probably Palkia. Maybe, maybe Greninja in there is just a better thing. Your third Honestly, Genesis, just, put he, cards. Just, just put Heatran in your, uh, <laughs> Mew, in your deck. Mew deck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> throw a couple fire energy. Some, you know, if you're, you still want a counter stadium, just throw the, you know, why not just get the basin, uh, the basin in there, some basic fires. Yeah. Works out. Heatran is a threat, though. Heatran is a threat. Use that Magvisin for the first time, and then he's charging up. He's coming for you. 
And um, speaking of the Mews, there were three Mews in the top 16. Jeremy Evans, Jeremy Lim, and Blake Lobina all playing the Mew. Nothing super crazy in these lists. I think uh, no catchers. It was all boss, yeah. all boss build. And all, that all is definitely the big thing for the turbo Palkia matchup, right? Because that's where Mew has an advantage. Mew goes first. Palkia has to set up for a turn, and then Mew can just go boss their Palkia. But yeah. if you're hiding behind a Deancey, that's not an option for Mew. So that's where it feels like that version of the deck gets the, its edge in the Mew matchup. Yeah, definitely, definitely for sure. Um, and even up against the other Palkia builds, that's like another thing with the uh, with the Palkia matchup against Mew is that as well as Palkia against Palkia. Like if you just get your Palkias out there and then get them to V stars before they can get bossed, like you don't have you're not hiding behind a Diancy like the Turbo build, but still like that's what you're trying to do is like chill, get to the V stars, and then you're kind of cruising from uh, from there. But yeah, all boss builds. I think we'll see that change. I mean, it's one of those things. I think we talked. Did I mention this last week? But like america versus the rest of the world as far as catchers yeah, versus did. no catchers yeah. in your in the muse um yeah america definitely likes catchers more in the Muse <laughs> than than uh australia and europe um and but right now it kind of makes sense that people are gonna be hiding behind diancies i think if you're gonna play you maybe we can see people go back to the cross with your muse with peony do you think you'd see it probably not the the peony <laughs> but i mean you you even even with no catchers you still have rope plus boss as an option and double diancy though i mean yeah if you i've can, done it i've done it every time i played up against him you with the turbo i've done it like three or four times i've always gotten, gotten double, double diancy down every single time and even I, if because because you can commit pretty heavily to it because like yeah uh you get to draw two cards with it and if they whiff the knockout on the next turn you can just be okay i'll just draw two cards again like and it's not you like, prize like when you just go get it with the history and heavy yeah. ball <laughs> yep yeah. yeah, I mean, that is a good point. So the rope isn't quite as good of an answer. So maybe the catchers just are the way for Mew VMAX this weekend. One thing I did think was kind of Catching. funny, we see Jeremy Evans played three trekking shoes. Blake played just one copy of trekking shoes. So it's like almost like uh, these guys had four trekking shoes, one play set between them, and just had to share. They, they, <laughs> they couldn't both commit to the shoes, so they just had to split them up. Yeah, they share they share like uh they share cards and they, they only had one place out of trekking shoes. <laughs> Blake got just the one, Jeremy Highrold got three copies. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What are your thoughts on the shoes in Mew? you've probably played quite a bit more Mew than I have. I, I have played it a little whenever I've been playing on the ladder, I'll mess around with Mew a bit here and there still. And I've been playing shoes in my list still, and I do like it. I have four copies right now. Um, the more I've played with it, the more I think Rotom Phone are probably still correct, or maybe some kind of split I saw, or one of the li- <laughs> Yeah, Jeremy has Speaking three of- Rotom Phone, three Trekking yeah. Shoes, three cram o <laughs> Yeah, could not decide between the aggressive item cards, so just was like, I can't pick. I'm just going to play one of each, and then we'll see, or three of each, and we'll see how it goes. <laughs> so I think that's probably incorrect. One of them should probably be a four of, but I could see like two Rotom Phone, four shoes, or three shoes, maybe. I think cram o I think I've come to terms with Mew as like, with a deck like Chromatic is such an impactful card in the deck when you get the heads. Like I don't think Rotom Phone or Trekking Shoes can make up for the impact Chromatic has. Like I think you should just play four Chromatic always um, because the impact that it has when you hit the heads is just so much higher than maybe doing something with a shoes or a phone. So I think that should always be maxed out. But uh, I'm actually the phones. I have a build with four phone, four cram, four shoes right now. So that one's like all out turbo. But I think phone is probably still correct the more I've played. Four phone feels bad, so maybe like a 2-2 split even. Um, like once you get to four phone, if you don't already have four shoes, like having four phone, they just don't they just do not do anything a lot of the time. But cra- like shoes never feel bad. Phones feel bad like 40% of the time. They just don't feel good when you're playing it. You're like, I have this. I guess I'll play it because I need more cards off my Genesect. And then you end up playing the phone and it doesn't do anything really, so... And then one last deck uh, that we should definitely talk about real quick before we move on is the Rapid Strike Intellium VMAX. This kind of deck that just feels like it pops its head up every once in a while. It does have the four path to the peak in here, which is pretty good against the Muse and pretty good against the Order of Form Palkia decks. And then, of course, three copies of Cheryl. Intellium doesn't get KO'd very easily by Palkia. I don't know. What are your thoughts on this deck right now? Um, I got to I'm just going to assume that it's still not great. It seems still pretty mediocre. I think it's one of those decks where it's like it just kind of feels like it cheeses its way to like 
decent placements a lot of the time but I, yeah i feel like it's never ever in content it feels like a deck that you like it feels like whenever it, we see it pop up in these like top 16 scenarios it like was on the winning into top 16 it didn't lose the winning into top eight you know it's like one of those decks where it's like it struggles to win up to 16 it's not on the winning in for top eight you know what i'm saying like mm-hmm. it's never going to be comfortably into a top eight the deck just isn't powerful enough i don't think and i think there's so many ways to exploit what the deck tries to do in game um that it just seems like yeah it just seems like a, like i can't even imagine like <laughs> the turn you go down to two prize cards if your opponent boss KOs your artillery and then rock sands you next turn to two like how are you finding a rapid strike energy <laughs> <laughs> like i don't know stuff like that like it just seems like the deck can't quite keep up with like so much so much stuff right now and now you have the pressure of greninja on you as well so you got to keep your mana fee in play like yeah yeah not a huge fan yeah intellion's definitely like it it's normally this deck that I feel like people come back to later in a format. So I'm kind of surprised to, that we saw it early in the format yeah. at the first regionals. Um, but, you know, it's still like, okay. And, you know, it has yeah. those things going for it, like I mentioned. So I think we'll see it probably pop up in day two of tournaments here and there, but probably not very often getting into the top eight, if ever, honestly. So that yeah. uh, wraps up the Melbourne Regional Championships. And speaking of the Melbourne Regional Championships, there's a little bit of a Twitter <laughs> beef drama, whatever you want to say, <laughs> going on uh, from the Pokemon Go community um, in regards to Melbourne Regional. Well, I don't know about the community. I think there's one person. Okay, from the sure. Community. Yeah, one I person. I haven't seen anyone else say anything. But <laughs> so uh, this is just kind of like a, a, a funny little thing. It's not really drama. We're just kind of messing around when we're talking about that but let's cover this situation just talk about it we thought it was funny so we wanted to talk about it so this player uh who some person who plays pokemon go is actually a pokemon go creator i think has like 25k subs on youtube so definitely not a small creator by any means uh tweeted a picture of the pokestats top eight you know showing the eight palkia <laughs> v star which is definitely a very funny picture And uh, their comment was, if you ever think the Pokemon Go championship meta looks stale, here's where the TCG is at right now. So I don't think that's the (laughs) most fair assessment since it is our first regionals in the format. But, you know, it's funny, right? You know, eight of the same deck in top eight, never really going to happen again. Just, you know, taking a quick stab, you know, funny, you know, good. It's a it's a funny tweet. Got a lot of likes. That's fine. And then we have Philip Bagley here who said, you're complaining Uh, Sorry, you're comparing a complex card game to a tapping game. (laughs) So taking a little (laughs) bit of a shot at the Pokemon Go PvP community. Um, You know, it's been criticized. Just, you know, all you're doing is just tapping the screen, tapping the screen. You've even made a joke about it before, Azul, whenever they show little (laughs) clips of it from EUIC, like how they're just sitting there tapping away. Um, (laughs) It's hard to take seriously when you're like, they did the little pan over. You're just like watching the two players like (laughs) doing that. (laughs) And then, uh, you know, and, but I, I think all of this, you know, it's fine. It's in good fun. It's just Twitter banter. Everyone's just there yeah. to, you know, make a little joke, have a good meme, whatever. But Ryan's response to this was pretty, uh, it definitely blew up in the TCG community a little bit, where Ryan yeah. replied and said, the TCG is anything but complex. Pokemon Go is far more complicated and skill-based. And he, uh, or they tweeted this several hours ago, like, I think, you know, 12 hours before it kind of caught wind in the TCG community. And then I don't know who it was who saw it first, but someone replied and just said, tap, 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 tap. (laughs) And then if you scroll through the replies of this tweet, it is all tap, 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 tap. There are dozens and dozens of TCG players who have taken this tweet by storm and just <laughs> tapped just spammed the replies with tap 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 making of course the joke of pokemon go being nothing more than a tapping simulator <laughs> a tapping game so i just thought this was kind of like a little bit of a funny story i think that pokemon go is way more than just a tapping game. I personally have not played any PvP, but I have watched a few of the streams. There's definitely plenty of strategy to it. I don't know all the details behind team building, but I'm sure there is some aspect there that is really difficult and, you know, very important. Similar to VGC, how you train your Pokemon is definitely a big deal. Obviously, I would imagine it is very similar in Pokemon Go. So there is more to it than just tapping. 
But for Ryan to say that the TCG isn't complex, and then also in a follow-up tweet say, I played competitively for three years, and most <laughs> of the decks play themselves. I mean, that just could not be farther from the truth when it comes to the competitive Pokemon TCG. Yeah, I mean, it just sounds... I mean, definitely a... Uh a poor comment to uh to make from from anyone talking about anything i feel like um so bad comment from him um and but i mean it sounds like he knows way more about the pokemon go than the pokemon tcg i mean i it's not like he came out with a bunch of accolades he gained in the pokemon tcg right so yeah, it's not true. like uh it's not like oh this game's really easy look at me i showed up to my first regional in one or something right so maybe if he had come with that all right, then then you got something to work with, right? But <laughs> I'd never heard of them before. Um, apparently, they're pretty. They're pretty. Uh, it seems like they're pretty big in the Pokemon uh, Go community, though. So, but sounds like they know a lot about that game, so they understand the depth of it, um, and then have played the Pokemon TCG. But doesn't sound like they understand the depth of the Pokemon TCG. And then, um, if they did, I think they would have a little bit more to back up their <laughs> claim for sure. Yeah, and I'll just share what my what I said on Twitter about it. Um... Or I said, I totally get that Pokemon Go is way more complex than just tap, tap, tap. But saying sure. that the Pokemon TCG is not complex and that the decks just play themselves could not be farther from the truth. So I think it was definitely a uh, poor judgment call. And he has certainly uh, gotten <laughs> memed appropriately for it, I would say. Yeah, I, think I that hope that no one is out there harassing Ryan for this because that is certainly taking it too far. But, you know. I think a, a good little uh, Twitter banter. It, it's definitely made. It, it's been a a good me a, t a good Twitter meme of the week. You know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you're gonna make a if you're gonna make a stupid comment and you're you're gonna get memed on, like yeah. that's it's fair, right? Like yeah, um, yeah, definitely Play fair. Stupid definitely games fair. win stupid prizes, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> For sure. Um, but yeah, definitely. Yeah, both games take a tremendous amount of skill, and uh, yeah, it's not like. I've never never dived into Pokemon Go, but um, <clears throat> I wouldn't I wouldn't trash talk their game for any reason for sure. <laughs> well, we'll move on from that and on to, of course, everyone's favorite segment of the podcast. Guess that flavor text, where one of us will pick a card, read the flavor text off of it, and allow the other player to guess. You, of course, can play along at home. Right now, Azul is leading two points to one. We, of course, also have three lifelines. If you don't use any lifelines, you get four points. And the three lifelines you can choose from are what set the card is from, what stage the card is, and then you can also have the chooser read an attack name. It is my turn to guess. Azul's turn to pick. Azul, why don't you hit us with it? What do we got this week? All right. The uh, flavor text for Chip and the rest of you to guess Um is <clears throat> this Pokemon will look into your eyes and read the contents of your heart. If it finds evil there, it promptly hides away. Is that a, is that a correct? Promptly hides away? Wouldn't you say like promptly runs away? Like what does what does it mean to hide? Like to hide away? Yeah, like, hide go, away is fine. Yeah. It sounds a little off though. I don't know. All right, but, read, uh, it, yeah, read it one more time. <clears throat> this Pokemon will look into your eyes and read the contents of your heart. If it finds evil there, it promptly hides away. Well, it definitely feels like a psychic Pokemon. That is going to be my first inclination. <laughs> I don't know what that face is that you just made, if that is <laughs> obviously or a classic chip is. Could not be farther away from the, <laughs> the truth. Um, but I'm definitely going to need a little bit of help on this one. It can look into your mind. Is that what it said? Look into your mind. Look into your eyes and look read the contents your of your heart. To see the contents of your heart. Read. Read. Read the contents of your heart. Okay. I don't think that's going to be super relevant, but yeah. Sure, sure. Okay, let's start with um, – I'm definitely going to need to use some lifelines here. <laughs> I, I don't really even have that much of a guess at the moment. So let's start with um, what set the card is from. See if I can get a little help there. Shining Fates. Shining Fates. Oh, man, that's tough because that set has the shiny vault. <laughs> so it's <laughs> like we got all the Shining Fates stuff and the Shining Vault cards. Okay. Um, I know there is a... Shining Fates. All right, let me have you uh, read an attack name. 
Seibold. Okay. <laughs> I feel like that's a pretty popular attack name. Uh, it is, yeah. For, for psychic Pokemon, so I don't feel like that's helping me too much. Gosh, I cannot really remember. Shining Fates is not a huge set outside of the Shiny Vault, so I'm trying to remember what Pokemon are in the Shiny Vault, or that are not in the Shiny Vault, um, that are psychic type, because that's really what I'm kind of leaning towards right now is a psychic type of some sort. Let me... Um, let me see what the uh, stage of the card is. Last, um, last lifeline. It is a basic. It is a basic. Okay. Shining Fates basic psychic type Pokemon. Um, looks into your eyes to something the contents of your heart and if it doesn't like Read. it if it senses evil it hides away um shining fates basic cybolt so it's definitely a psychic type i was at least right there <laughs> i would actually be surprised if anyone gets this let us know in Jeez, the, the comments give me a hard course. one huh <laughs> well i saw the card the other day and i like read it and i was like that's like a it's a good flavor text. Good Is that what you do text, now? You yeah. read flavor texts when you're looking at cards? Yeah, I, yeah, I do actually. Yeah, <laughs> I've been reading them. Like whenever, like, cause like Lorelai will have so many cards, like just all around the house. Whenever I see just cards lying around, I like read the flavor texts. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm curious to actually see if any of the viewers get. So let us know in the comment um, section on the YouTube if you're watching on YouTube. Okay. If you got it, I think I might. And at what lifeline? I think I might have it. I wish I could ask if it was from the shiny vault or from the main set. I, I think the only thing I can think of that I can guess right now is Galarian Ponyta. And I don't know if this is right, but I think, I mean, that's really all I can think of. So I'm just going to lock it in. Galarian Ponyta. Yes. Let's no go. Way. Let's go. How did you get that? Let's go. How do you know that card exists in the set? <laughs> Bro, there's a shiny one. <laughs> so? <laughs> I, that card's in the broken bag of my cube. Oh, is it really? Yes, yes. That card is not broken. <laughs> well, the Rapidash is. Oh, I don't know what that does. It is It is from... That's how you know it, though, is because it's in, in your... The shiny oh, vault. my gosh. Let's go. Your boy got a point. First it's time in, in a few cube. weeks. <laughs> that's so ridiculous. It's in my cube, baby. <laughs> it is in the shiny vault, yeah, because it has SV. Yeah. That means it's from the... Yeah, okay. Wow, that's absurd. All right. You really thought you got me there, huh, buddy? I didn't, well, I didn't think you'd get it. And then all of a sudden, you're just like, all right, Galarian Pony Chow. <laughs> I just was sitting there. I couldn't think of any basic psychic Pokemon that were in, like, the the ones I were thinking. I was thinking of, uh, I can't think, I still don't know any that are in the main set. I can't think of a single one in the main set. But I know of the Shiny Vault, I was thinking Galarian Cursula. That's not it, for sure. And then I was thinking um, Dreepy, and I know it's not that for sure. Those are ghost yeah. types, not psychic types, so that didn't really fit the bill. Azul doesn't I, mean, I want to be able to know the stuff. difference. Yeah, I want to know that that difference. Bro, they're both purple. <laughs> <laughs> All right, your boy's on the board. Let's go. All right, so moving on, let's talk Milwaukee. And the first thing we're going to mention, actually, before we talk too much about the real Pokemon stuff, is uh, me and Chip uh, a little while ago decided to get some custom um uncommon energy dice made we did um and uh we're gonna have them on us to give out at the upcoming tournaments um so if you guys want one um you, if you want to see the picture of them go check out uh, our twitter i got um, it pulled uncommon, up right here if you're watching the youtube channel yeah what is it uncommon what is our twitter again uncommon, uncommon un underscore underscore energy. energy i wasn't sure if there's an underscore or not but yeah we're gonna have some custom un uncommon pot uh, uncommon energy podcast dice to give out at uh uh, Milwaukee, NAIC, and I'll be at uh, uh, Worlds, so we'll have some dice there. So if you guys want any of them, just find us and uh, say what's up and ask for a die because we'll have them on us uh, throughout the uh, the weekends at those events. So yep, we're uh, wanting yeah. to give these out for free. We want you guys to rep the podcast. We've talked about doing merch and stuff like that. Uh, we will probably do t-shirts and hats and stuff like that at some point, but just yep. for now, we wanted to do these dice and. Um, yeah, instead of selling them, we were just like, yeah, we'll just give them out to people at regionals and stuff like that. Yeah. So we've got a bunch of them. Each of us will have a decent amount on us. We've got some that we're going to give out at all the tournaments, like we said. So if you miss out in Milwaukee, we'll be at NAIC and then Worlds as well. So there will be opportunities 
to get them, hopefully for anyone who is interested in grabbing one from us. So you can, they, they are clear dice, translucent dice. They are tournament legal flip dice. So you can use them as your randomizer, keep them in your deck box or your dice bag, whatever you carry along to keep your uh, dice and stuff in. So yeah, we'd appreciate it if you guys, if you want to pick one up, just come find us. We'll be happy to give you one. Yep, for sure. All right, so let's talk about um, <clears throat> Milwaukee, but also NAIC is right the weekend. Like you said, it's less than a week after Milwaukee is NAIC, and that's why I'm not even coming home, and I'm going to be away for 10 days because it doesn't make sense for me to fly back Monday from Milwaukee to then two days later fly back out to Columbus. So I'm staying with a friend in Wisconsin instead and then driving down to NAIC. Um, but for everyone that's not going to Milwaukee – what do you do? Do you like, do you have you picked your deck and do you think you should just stick with that deck irrelevant of what happens at Milwaukee? And that's what I would recommend for most people. Like if you're playing Palkia and Teleon, or if you've come up with a way for Arceus and Teleon to beat Palkia and Teleon like a, a decent amount of the time, or if you just want to, if you're like, if you've been practicing Mew, do you let Milwaukee change your pick for NAIC that much? Or do you kind of just rock with what you've got as of like right now or like a week ago? Yeah, I think that neither is the wrong answer. I do think that regardless, you should definitely look at the results from Milwaukee um, and take those into consideration and think about the decks that are popular and familiarize yourself, of course, with the lists that end up doing really well because that will change a bunch of people's ways that they're deciding to, you know, decks that they're deciding to play for in AIC. I would definitely encourage anyone who is not going to be um, who's not going to be playing in Milwaukee to tune into the stream. It will be streamed by Pokemon, like we mentioned at the top of the cast. I will be casting, which I'm really looking forward to, looking forward to seeing what decks and what other people do to try to combat the Palkia onslaught that is sure to be coming. Um, but yeah, I, I don't. I think that if you have a deck built already that you feel comfortable with and you're confident with, I wouldn't worry too much about changing your play for NAIC versus Milwaukee because the reality is if your deck is solid, even no matter what happens in Milwaukee, your deck will still be a fine. If it's solid now, it will still be solid at NAIC because the yeah. reality is it's just going to be a massive tournament. It's going to be potted. So there will be two different pods for the event as well because of how many players there are. So there's just going to be so much variance in what you could be playing against. You might be playing against other people who have, um lists that are not necessarily updated and, and like my round one of naic in like 2017 i played against someone who was playing like a septile ex area dose deck which is just like not a real deck <laughs> like you, you'll get you'll get stuff like that sometimes because these tournaments are so big people who just play casually come out and play at them you know um, yeah that makes me remember i played against i lost to it actually i when i was the year of uh, the year toward one, I was playing Slow Canyon, and I played against a Yen Mega Lycan Rock deck round one. <laughs> I opened and like lost. baby, I opened baby Volcano and six energy in one of the games. I remember I was just doing twenty and nothing else in the first. Turn. <laughs> yeah, I mean those things will uh, those things will happen. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean you, I you'll mean, just you'll get like people play so many different things at these tournaments, and there are. It's going to be so large. It's just hard yeah. to really plan super perfectly. Now, I do think at the top level, the top like 1% of players will do not know what they're playing for NAIC yet. And 100% will make a decision based on what does well in Milwaukee. So if you're at that top yeah. level, like you, I'm sure, Azul, are going to be doing a ton of testing in the week leading up to NAIC based on the results of Milwaukee. And I'm sure many yeah. of the other top players will be doing the same thing. But for most players, it's really not that big of a deal. Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. And yeah, for most players, the thing is like, it's going to be harder for you to, you know, put down your Mew deck you've been playing for two weeks and then pick up Turbo Palkia and play it as efficiently as a top player. And yes. that's why the better you get at the game, the easier that is to do. And your window of picking a deck becomes smaller and smaller, the better and better you get and allows you to make, you know, those last minute meta calls so much more seamlessly. Um, the one thing I always recommend to people is, you know, try and pick out your deck, you know, two to three weeks in advance, ideally from that major tournament you're playing at, but don't lock in. I think it's really bad to have a lock in 60 cards. Like if for some reason, tool scrapper is really good between, between after Milwaukee ends and NAIC is going to happen, then find a room for a tool scrapper. Don't be like, nope, this is the 60 I've been playing. There's no way I could ever 
<laughs> ever learn to play efficiently with a tool scrapper in these next four days <laughs> by cutting one other card out of my deck right what the tool scrapper and it's not that hard i think most of the time it's more so people psyching themselves out than it actually is hard to you know make that one or two card adjustments right so don't lock in a 60 but if you've locked in a deck choice for the last week or two then run with that deck choice you know just make the the tech adjustments you know from milwaukee to naic but um yeah, don't be afraid to make those tech adjustments either. You know, like it, you don't have to lock in sixty cards three weeks or a month ago, right? You can you can change a couple cards. They can make a big difference in you know the outcome of a lot of your games. Put the tool jammer in your palkia deck, stuff like that. So before Melbourne, we did an over under for Origin Form Palkias in <laughs> top eight. We put the over under at two point five, and we both said under. So we thought there would be two or one. We were vastly incorrect as well so we're gonna have to yeah. move the over under a little bit for and uh sorry for milwaukee so over under origin form palky of e-star in top eight of milwaukee we're gonna put the over under this time at 3.5 what do you think i'm uh, more than three and a half <laughs> or less than three and a half i'm probably not gonna i'm gonna say less than three and a half because i'm probably not gonna play palky personally for milwaukee so i'm gonna say less than three and a half but i also do want a top eight so I'm top eighteen and not playing Palkia. There's got to be some other people who are also <laughs> doing the same thing. So love the confidence. under under three under three and a half under three and a half unearned confidence so far this season. But you know you got to have it at some <laughs> point. <laughs> we'll get you back into cut as well. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, I also think I would take the under. I feel like a lot of the top players will try and find a way to have a really solid answer against the turbo palkia list and not go into that tournament with a uh, poor matchup you know they'll take either a 50 50 or a slightly favorable i feel like so and i also feel like there's just so many players who have played so much arceus the last few months and the same is true for mew as well they've played so much mew the last few months that it's hard for them to switch off of it for this tournament you can just adjust to the new cards into the new meta yeah yeah definitely um so i just think there's uh, origin form palkia will definitely i think 3 will probably be the number i think there will probably three. be 3 in cut <laughs> I would be so surprised if it is over 50% again, especially because I mean, this tournament's going to be so much bigger. We could just see what happened. Melbourne to Salt Lake City. You know, we're doing it Australia. Into you think there's going to be none? Milwaukee. There could be none. none. I mean, you looked at some of the, some like there was the, there was the 5k tournament, uh, the car trooper 5k tournament that happened in uh, Kentucky. Yeah, and there was Kentucky. zero Palkia in top eight. There was zero Palkia in top eight. There's a yeah. lot of cheesy stuff in that top eight, but there, yeah, there's zero Palkia. Yeah, and I think um, that is a definitely a product of the um of the people who are just like comfortable with these other decks. Like we did yeah. see some new decks, like I think Pram got top four with the Reggie Gigas. Yeah. But you know, Pram is, you know, one of the top players who's gonna play whatever he thinks is best for a tournament, or I guess in that instance, whatever he thinks he's gonna have the most fun with. <laughs> but Gigas, yeah. <laughs> uh, Gigas with no heavy ball, bro. He was really <laughs> I yes. don't know what he was doing. <laughs> um but uh yeah yeah definitely yeah. and i could i would have been i would have been like one of those things like i talked about it's like a little scary to see eight palky like for the game in general if there would have been eight palky in the top eight of that tournament as well that would have been that would have been like bad well i think <laughs> like the a big bad thing the in game. regards to that is like there was eight palkia in cut and there was zero arceus like zero arceus in top yeah. 16. 16 like arceus yeah. did not show up hardly at all in melbourne so is that like a bad sign for the game <laughs> that it's like whatever the big new card is from the new set just outclasses the previous big card from the new set completely because people just spent you know 150 bucks getting their arceus cards and then now they gotta spend 150 bucks to go get palkia cards arceus cards just are useless now is that really where we're at or is it a little too early to say that i, f I feel like it's a little too early right. to say that definitively right yeah, I think it's too early, but it would be a bad sign if it is if the trend continues, right? If, if Arceus can't recover, and I think from what we've seen in Japan is Arceus hasn't recovered. Um, but what we also saw in Japan, was, uh, so maybe they just messed up like they did with Mew. They maybe also messed up with Palkia because um, Zorark is out, is, over, uh, is out over there, but I don't think Zorark's doing very well right now. I think it's just Palkia is like dominant still. Like even mm -hmm. with the release of Zorark, Palkia is still like, okay, that's cute. Um, so, I mean... I mean, I like. I think even if you're not a on the 
Yo, Mew should be banned. Bandwagon, I think we can all agree Mew was overtuned a little bit. And we could be seeing the, seeing the same thing with Palkia. And even if Zorark isn't tuned a little bit higher to all of a sudden dominate the meta after Palkia, which would also be bad, it's still bad to have these new cards come out and be unplayable. Um, and we almost saw it with Arceus too, where it was like, okay, Mew is still good, but you're either playing Mew or you're playing Arceus, right? Like Arceus kind of killed off the possibility for anything else to kind of, not completely, but it was there was a lot of Arceus before Astral Radiance dropped. Now Astral Radiance drops, and it's like, okay, here's Palkia. You can't play Arceus anymore. And then if Zorak drops, and it's like, you can't play that because Palkia is still here, that's still bad, right? If we can't even play, and you can play Zorak, obviously, but it doesn't mean it, if you can't win, that's that's a problem, right? Yeah, I mean, you definitely just need more. The, the meta needs more time to develop. There needs to be more tournaments. Yeah. So, I mean, even in Japan, like you can't just make that assumption from one tournament, right? Uh, to me, oh, Zorak yeah. seems absolutely. Bonkers, I agree. But, but like, if you can't be Paul, like something can be bonkers and not be able to be Palkia, right? Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, it'll, it'll, it'll super bonkers. Yet to be seen. We'll see at Worlds, I guess, where that card will most likely be out in legal for the World Championships. I would imagine it will be. It seems like it won't be. Like I, I actually had this discussion with my chat, and someone was throwing out some. There was the the date where it was being thrown around. It seems like it'll come out after. Worlds. Well, have they said the next set's release date yet? I don't think so. I thought I thought I thought it said that was someone was saying it was the week after Worlds, but I could be wrong. I could we could be wrong on that. Um. Was Worlds is what the nineteenth? Oh yeah. Uh, apparently, yeah. according Poke Beach said that yeah. according to the PTCG Live database, the next oh. set will be named Lost Origin, and it. Oh, this just says it should release internationally on August twenty sixth. It doesn't okay. say when it will, and it is a little weird that we haven't gotten that announcement yet. We normally definitely have that by now, of like the next set coming out. So I wonder if they're almost trying to like speed it up to get it legal for Worlds. But yeah, maybe. But honestly, like, <laughs> if we're being real, the competitive Pokemon TCG is such a small sect of the importance of releasing a, po the, a new Pokemon set that I can almost see that not being super relevant. But at the same time, the World Championships is, like, their biggest yeah. marketing thing of the year. So it's like they and may want like the new set to be legal for Worlds. And I feel like they're trying to do more with the competitive side of stuff recently. It Definitely. seems like they're trying, but it seems like they're constantly headed in that direction. So maybe we're just always on like a really slow trek in that direction. It's just constantly. Yeah, it's um, not even, even like we it's like two steps forward, one step back. It's almost like just like it's like tiny, tiny, tiny baby <laughs> steps forward constantly, right? <laughs> yeah, <which laughs> and then is like every really once in a while we take like a reasonable size step backwards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not even it's not even as good as two steps forward as one step back because by the time the baby steps get up to one step, it's like, you know, two years down the road or <laughs> yeah, whatever. Yeah, it takes um, a little too long. But at the very least, we should have the Pokemon Go set. And there's I think there's some pretty impactful cards in that set. A lot of the the biggest thing is the radiant cards, which you can like build decks around, right? Like you yeah. I saw LDF made a video with uh like a, like you just kept using radiant heatran over and over again um so i mean like i said he, radiant heatran is a threat if you can use it every single turn of a game like that's one of ko and everything right like yeah so there's, there's some big ones coming out the venusaur uh, i guess the venusaur doesn't quite get there until we get the arcanine in the next set so maybe not but the the charizard looks yeah, good the venusaur with know. arcanine is insanely good <laughs> so for cool sure. yeah uh, the Charizard is nuts, and it is always really scary whenever a Charizard card, especially a shiny, radiant Charizard yeah. card, is competitive. It's worth like $100. <laughs> it probably won't be that much. I mean, it'll be like reasonably expensive, but you know, if it's a similar rarity level to how hard it is to pull the radiant Pokemon in the current set, where you're getting like two to three per box, um, obviously the Pokemon Go set probably won't have booster boxes, but um, if you're getting it you know one out of every like 18 ish packs it probably won't be that bad if there's just the three of them in there the yeah the venus or the blastoise and the charizard it'll still be expensive but it probably won't be like a hundred dollar card fingers crossed right <laughs> yeah <laughs> you but, only need one so like it's yes, not exactly. won't be that i know it'll only be played in some decks i imagine but it's pretty good so but like when reshizard was popular you played that at that first regionals that it was legal for do you remember how much you had to pay for them it was like Mad it was Madison. Um, Rush oh, it was, it was played with the Mill Tank version of the deck, right? It was legal at Santa Clara, the the oh, one before that. Okay. Yeah, I don't remember. I didn't. Uh, it was definitely I, I really close to like the beginning of the format, right? Where. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't too far off. They'd gone down since then because like it didn't. Well, I guess it had won. It just won the pre that previous regional. Yeah. Um. But yeah, the tag teams were pretty expensive, I guess as well. They weren't. It didn't feel like they were expensive. I don't know why. 
<clears throat> but, but anyway, um, we need to continue on here. We're definitely going a little bit long yeah. <laughs> on the time. We can, as you guys see, we can talk about Pokemon for a long time. So looking back to, let's dial it back to Milwaukee. Let's look at Mew, the most popular, or I guess like the deck that everyone, you know, has pegged as the best deck in the format for the last format. Doesn't really feel like that's the case for this format. Where do we feel like it stands going into Milwaukee? Does it stand up to Palkia or is it just not quite good enough? There were still three in top 16 of Melbourne. Yeah, um, I mean, I guess that almost feels like a bad thing, right? If Mew isn't the best deck in the format, it almost feels like that can't be a good thing because of how good Mew is, right? So, sure. Um, and that's another, once again, talking back to Palkia, is it is Palkia too good? It's like, that's scary. If Mew's not the best deck in the format, like it would have been fine if Mew deck was, Mew was just the best deck in the format. We just had to ride it out till it rotated. But if cards are going to be better than Mew, oh, it's kind of scary. Um, So what does it have to do in the current format? I think you have to play catcher, at least yeah. for Milwaukee, and see where Diancy ends up. Because right now, Turbo Palkia for sure will be a deck that you probably want to have a, a solid game plan against. But right now, Mew with boss, I feel like it's a pretty bad, lines up pretty poorly into uh, just Diancy in general. And who knows what else is going to show up with Diancy? Like, I mean, so the Australian regionals happened, right? And um, like we even said, that's that's a smaller player base over there. We have not seen at all what Europe's cooking up. We haven't seen what any of the Americans are cooking up. Like, there's a lot that could show up at, and are people holding it? Are, are the Americans not going to play their spice at Milwaukee and hold it for NAIC? I know some players have different mentalities about that. Like, if you have the deck, play the deck before someone else plays it, or it gets countered and someone plays something similar, then people are countering it. So... There's that mentality. It's like win Milwaukee and then just play something else and then try and win NAIC. Or do you hold that deck that you think wins the tournament no matter what, as long as it shows, as long as someone else doesn't bring it to the event and you save that for NAIC. So there's still a lot of people cooking. Hopefully not everyone's just cooking up different ways to play Palkia. <laughs> there's some <laughs> other stuff out there, but I think you got to go with the catchers in the Mew for right now, especially because you don't know what other Diancy stuff is out there besides just the Diancy in this um, turbo. Yeah, I think when it comes to saving a deck versus playing it for the tournament i definitely lean towards playing it for the tournament be the person to play it because there's a decent chance especially with how large these tournaments are and how quickly information goes around online nowadays there's a pretty reasonable chance if you don't show up to milwaukee with it if you're hiding the secret deck someone else probably is playing something very similar and so it will be known play it if you think you've got a chance to play it i don't think that holding it for a whole week is really going to be a reasonable strategy and also like in a week you, you still want to win a regionals right so yeah, if your yeah, deck is that nice. good i mean winning in internets versus winning a regionals sure and internets is bigger and you know you win more money but i don't know winning a regionals would still be pretty awesome if you ask me yeah i mean i think this is like this situation is a little bit of an anomaly like we've never, i don't think we've ever had a situation like this new set came out uh we've had one major tournament in it so far in australia but that was such an anomaly it feels like it doesn't have as much impact on the meta to like you know, push some kind of idea out of the way. Like there was nothing too ridiculously creative. Like the turbo, it's but it's still Palkia, right? There's a turbo Palkia engine, cool, still Palkia. So it still has the same weaknesses. So with these events so close together, and and if you had to pick one to win, you obviously want to win the IC. Like I don't hate the idea of of if you've got that if you've got the spice, just hold on to it for four days <laughs> and then play it then and then of course like the majority Sounds of the like Azul's got the spice guys <laughs> the majority of the european players you know um they're gonna have stuff for milwaukee for sure right uh unless they're, once again if everyone's just brewing palkia it's possible everyone's just cooking up different ways to play palkia and they're all trying to beat the mirror and then who knows we have eight palkias in the top eight of naic so let's talk about Reggie Gigas, which just won a massive tournament in Japan. It like won the tournament. I feel like this Reggie yeah. Gigas. How many like, people was that? Do you know? I'm not sure, but if it's anything like the, let me see if Pokestats has the data. Um, but if it's anything like the thousand normal, least, right? yeah, they're almost always just massive, 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 um, like 1500 plus. I don't see it on Pokestats. And I know Limitless didn't have it earlier, so. Yeah, I was thinking, for some reason, I was thinking, like, the tournament maybe wasn't as big as I thought it was, but there was, like, 15,000 people hundred, watching hundred. the finals. Oh, no, watching. Thousand. Oh, okay. Watching, watching. watching. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They actually had a lot of viewers on, yeah, the, the, on the, the Japanese, Japanese dude, on YouTube. Yeah, the Japanese, they have, their market is players, <laughs> whereas our market is, yeah. like, pull the shiny Charizard. <laughs> <laughs> 
it's yeah i mean they, yeah. Th- there are so many more players in japan especially when you consider the size of their country versus the size of the rest of the world <laughs> um their player base is just massive compared to like the collector base. now there is still plenty of collectors obviously but i mean the culture in japan is obviously very unique in its own compared to cultures outside of asia but you know either way reggie gigas just won a big tournament in japan we talked about how pram got top four with it at the car trooper tournament Reggie Gigas is definitely, I think at first, I was definitely in the camp of, like, before the tournament started happening, I was in the camp of, like, this deck is cool, but it's just, like, a fun little meme deck, and then yeah, it did too. really well at the full grip tournament, I was like, this deck is kind of legit, it's pretty decent, it, you know, beats Mew, I will say it also feels like that deck has a very solid matchup against the Turbo Palkia list that won Melbourne, it feels yeah, like Reggie Gigas definitely. actually actually has a good matchup against that deck which is uh, here. we found it's one good matchup everybody <laughs> well i am more so mean finding the palkia lists yeah bad matchup but yeah exactly so it just won this big tournament seems decent against the deck that just won melbourne are we gonna see gigas show up in milwaukee i think it was always gonna show up. it's it's like on the left it's like it's like you have mew i almost just want to like palkia decks I, and Arceus, I feel like you have to categorize Arceus as Arceus archetypes because you got Arceus and Teleon, which it even like in the online tournaments has become the less popular uh, <laughs> of the two. You got the Arceus and Teleon, which has become less popular. Than the, the, but then the Arceus B-Barrel variants are so all over the place. Like people got Decidueye, Flying Pikachu, the Water Pikachu. You got some Malamars. You got some Baby Jolteons. Like, um, so it's like Palkia, Mew, Arceus decks. And then under that, you have like the Ice Riders, the Blissey Mill Tanks, the Gigases, and I think they're all going to be pretty similar in play rate. They'll be about that 5 4 5% play rates um, with that that whole mix down there. Um, so I don't think it's going to show up anymore. The deck is still like... Um, it feels like it's just one of those decks that it just one of those decks that will never catch on. It'll never be... Like, be, like, it'll have its, like... As far as, like, when I look at, like, online results, like, if it wins a regional... Um, and it would have to be like an American regional or European regional or, or the Australian regional because it, like the Japanese tournament, just so many less players know about those and like don't see it. Then it'll be like the most popular deck the next day in online tournaments, but then it'll like come back down to its, you know, 5%. So I think it was always going to show up around, around that 5% mark. I don't think it's going to show up anymore, maybe a little bit. Cause yeah, it does seem like it has that solid Paul Kim matchup a little bit more spotlight on it because of the Japanese tournament. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the next solid. So I, I don't know why it's not like, I think a lot of people still think it's a meme, but I agree with you. That's what I literally thought the deck was terrible. I was like memeing on it when it's, when the set first came out, but I think it's really good now. I think it's a very solid deck overall. Yeah, I definitely agree. It's very solid. And I think we will see it. I, I think we will see, I'm going to say it here. We'll see one, one. Richie Gigas in cut. <laughs> At least one. It probably At won't be more one. than one. We'll see a, we a Gigas see a couple. in cut. Um, but another deck that you just mentioned a moment ago that I think we should talk about is the Blissey Mill Tank, something that was pretty popular in Japan for a while, had some success. It's done decently in online tournaments. Mill Tank is pretty solid, it feels like, right now overall. Um, so how do you feel about Blissey Mill Tank and also just like Mill Tank in general? And I guess we can lump one other deck in with this, and that's Wormadam slash Zork Box. Because um, I feel like that is another great place for Mill Tank to fit right now. Yeah, I mean, I think Blissey Mill Tank is scary. Like I, and it's the, the scarier part of the deck is the Blissey, not really the Mill Tank. Like the Blissey, the the Mill the Mill Tank scary if you have no answer, or they remove your answer from play. But like Blissey, like ramps up so fast. And I didn't really play Blissey last format when it got DTE, um, but that thing's insane with Hyper Potion. Like you just it, like usually what would happen with Blissey before DTE is it would take so long to ramp the Blissey up, right? But now when you're putting like three DTEs on your Blissey and then they hit you and then you like go Hyper Potion attach three more energy back on it, like you ramp so much faster because the Hyper Potions, uh, you're doing more damage with the DTEs and the Hyper Potions like reduce your ramp up speed um, less because of the DTEs that like Blissey is super scary, super fast. Um, and of course stuff like Starmie kind of keeps it in check and Mew can like one hit KO it, like not too hard. It's got 250 unless you get the cape, but um I mean, Blissey Miltank is just kind of good. Uh, and Miltank in general, it like I, I think Miltank is probably waiting to be like, to, there's going to be like 
it's gonna like just show up one time like a mill tank control deck will just show up and win a win a regional and they'll be like all right we got a tech for mill tank now then everyone will tech for it and then we yeah. might enter that cycle the, the, the decidui cycle where yeah it wins it goes it has to be tech for and repeat and know? it's definitely like, you something you can tech for like you can yeah. play one prizers you can play canceling cologne you can play phoebe you know if you're playing a vmax deck like there are cards in the format uh, Hisuian Decidu IV is something we have yeah, seen popping a up a, a decent amount because it's a fighting type. It one hit KOs it, even through like a Cape of Toughness or something like that. So there are answers out there in the format. Um, but I think the best time to play, I, I don't feel like people will be respecting Mill Tank going into this weekend. Like you'll see some yeah, Arceus decks that are playing so. the, um, you'll see some that are playing the, the Decidu I and you'll, probably see you know the the palkias that have the intellion which obviously that's their answer to it but if you can deal with a couple intellions like it's still buying you time to set up something else i do think like it's definitely just got to be mill tank with something else either blissey or like i mentioned the zork box wormadam which is a deck i've been a big fan of recently i did a video on it on channel fireball definitely something i've enjoyed um i think it's got solid matchups uh palkia maybe is a little iffy i do think with the mill tanks you can be decent because um especially against the turbo list what you can do is like you put a mill tank up there they star me into it then you can try to knock out the star me with a wormadam um you know if it's late enough in the game or even the electrode potentially and then you have another mill tank that they can't do anything to, you know, because their Starmie is gone. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's got some, yeah, it's got some, yeah, the mill tanks are good. Mill tank's good. It's annoying. Like, I'm sure everyone's played up against some kind of mill tank deck at this point. It's like, it's yeah. hard to deal with mill tank. It's way harder than I thought it was going to be, to be honest. Like, even when you have your aqua bullet and stuff, and um, that's another reason to play tool jammer, by the way, in your Palkia deck. You shut off the cape. You want to kill the mill tank with your aqua bullet. Um, but, uh, yeah, the tank is... It's kind of scary for sure, and it and it, it, it's the the best partner so far that I've seen is the Blissey, yeah. Um, and Blissey's scary too. <laughs> Blissey can get really scary really fast. So definitely, um, he's got two scary Pokemon that can get two Pokemon that can get really scary really fast. So they kind of complement each other with that, which is like really weird when you look at some of the Blissey Mill Tank lists. It's just like, why does this work? <laughs> so let's look at this Turbo Engine that obviously won in Melbourne with the Muse, the trekking shoes, all that yep. stuff. We saw it be applied to Gengar as well, which got 10th place in Melbourne. It obviously originated in the Dialga deck that Reiji played and won a uh, late night tournament with online. So this turbo version, uh, this turbo engine, are there other places that we could see it be applied successfully at Milwaukee or even at an AIC potentially? I think, maybe it just feels like Palkia is the best but like it's hard is it I mean, it's, is it like one of those things where it's like hard to justify if you want to play this engine is it hard to put it with something besides Palkia type deal yeah a little bit because Palkia has such a wide range of what it can do like the ability the being able to attack with Greninja is like huge like when you play any of the other versions of the deck you're like but I can't attack with Greninja you lose so much pressure and so many options because of that um, you have the one KO potential. You have a really good aggressive way to do a turn two knockout on Vs. Like if it, Palkia, I would be surprised if there's something better than Palkia. However, with how the meta could shift, there could be something just as good for what the meta becomes. But I don't think it's ever going to be better than Palkia. I, but I would love to be surprised, right? I'd love to find, have someone find something better than Palkia. But um, I can't think of like anything off the top of my head. I don't know if you have any thoughts on like any other Pokemon that you think that just would work well with it. No, I don't think so. I saw a thread on Twitter, I think, from Chris Franco. He posted a bunch yeah, of uh, different attackers out there that you could work alongside it. I think besides Palkia, Gengar is probably the best one, and it did get 10th place in Melbourne. I do think Gengar is solid. You said you weren't a big fan of it. I actually do like it a, a, a quite a bit. Um but I, I don't think I would, like, pick it for this weekend as, like, my personal choice. But I do think it is strong. You can one-hit KO the Palkias, and you don't need a big bench, and you've got a lot of HP. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it, the, the Gengar's got potential, it seems like. I Dialga, do think I feel now like, that it, uh, it feels like Dialga is maybe the worst of the three yeah. options, which is kind of <laughs> funny because it was the one that originated this engine. Yeah, it still might be the best way to play Dialga, though, I think, for sure. Sure, for sure. Uh, and I think, unfortunately, because of the turbo engine, it's going to put the Dialga Dancy Diancy built on the back burner for everyone for a little while because now people are looking at escape ropes and cross switchers and Pokemon catchers and Mew. So I think of a slower Dialga build, there's definitely some viability there with like a 4 Diancy build, but now it's gonna have to wait maybe till NAIC, but maybe till till after that we look ahead towards towards it's actually we're not gonna get that many tournaments in this format, which 
well, maybe with how good Palky is, maybe that's just for the best. Maybe just like a couple get past worlds and NAIC just Paul Kia just wins four events in a row and then we get the new set and then hopefully you know it switches up a little bit <laughs> but so, what other decks like besides that those are the big ones yeah um i guess miltank plus isn't a huge deck but miltank's a big deal i think i think miltank's a big deal i think we both agree with that like there's stuff to do with miltank but like besides that are you afraid of anything else are you trying to prepare for anything else or are you look is there anything weird or different that you're gonna you would consider playing if you were playing this weekend um, we didn't really talk that much about Arceus now that I'm thinking about it. And Arceus is still obviously very good, but... It exists. I mean, I just mean the card itself, right? It's obviously yeah, yeah. Like a very good card. Um, I do think that if I wanted to play an Arceus deck, it's not Intellion anymore. I think I'm going Bidoof, and I'm probably, um, you know, going with the That's like one of the Pikachus, most likely. Um, probably the, the Lightning one, the Flying Pikachu. Um, yeah. Because that attacker is pretty solid because uh, it obviously beats Palkia for you. It does good against uh, Blissey as well because it, basic Pokemon can't damage it. So there's that plus side going to it. I think that we'll see a lot of players. Uh, there was like the funny meme, uh, I think, um, that hot chalk tweeted of like clicking through all the lightning type pokemon after yeah. <laughs> melbourne regionals right there's gonna be a lot of that this week right people are looking yeah. at all the lightning pokemon and trying to find something yo flaffy's time man it could be flaffy's time they did it it's so weird they gave us flaffy and then the best attacker they gave us to go with it was rayquaza i felt like that's what yeah. they gave us they didn't even give us lightning pokemon to go with flaffy they're like rayquaza v max and you get the flaffy and it's like why i wish flaffy had been the spotlight and had like a wide array of like different lightning attackers to combo with it and there is some good decent lightning pokemon right they're, they're not that good um there's the Ze the zekrom the auto paralyze yeah auto paralyze zekrom yeah, I actually, a Andrew uh, was playing that on his stream earlier today. I was watching a little bit. Was playing like a one prizer lightning deck with Zekrom. Also had the Zapdos in there from Vivid Voltage, where you do one sixty anywhere, um, yeah. which can one hit KO Palkia. Obviously, it can also target things on the bench as well. Zekrom auto paralyzing. We talked about how good auto paralysis is, and then you can clean up with the Raichu and just one hit KO anything theoretically. And also had a one one yeah. Pikachu flying pikachu in there so all right, i don't know all right <laughs> i lost you there <laughs> <laughs> you lost me at the one one pikachu there, there's definitely potential i think for us to see a deck make cut that is very unexpected and i would put a flaffy deck as something that is very unexpected and i think there is potential for yeah. for something like that to find space in this format which is what's fun about these new formats and you know undefined metas because anything can really happen you better not prize your mana if you're just gonna, gonna cook this your is sheep. True. This is very <laughs> true. Um, one other deck we should mention before we close things out is the Rapid Strike Urshifu. Where is the bear, Azul? We didn't see any really at all in Melbourne. It hasn't been doing great in online tournaments. Is Urshifu just not good right now? Or is it kind of a similar function to what it was in the last format where Maybe not the best right now, but it can kind of come into a better spot if someone comes up with a you know really solid list. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, maybe Palkia's... It's not a deck that I play very much. It's not a deck that I'm ever considering taking to a tournament, so I don't really play it ever. Um, I So I was actually talking about someone... Talking to the, this with someone recently, and I was like... My thought was like, maybe like the whole dark box build with all the options that... Um, that like toward, the more trays and all that. Yeah, yeah. That toward plays at every tournament. Is it, it maybe Palkia plus Greninja is just too much to handle, right? Like uh, Palkia just does too much damage, so you can't fill your bench. And they have Greninja, so you have to bench Manaphy, but now you don't get the whole squad. Um, so if that's just too much to handle, which is possible, I can definitely see that being too much to handle consistently. Then uh, maybe the way Urshifu makes its way back is once Mew gets pushed just far enough out of the meta, you just play straight Urshifu. You bring back straight Urshifu. And 330 HP is pretty good into Palkia. Like, that's hard. That's a big number for Palkia to hit. And you're just using Gale Thrust, maybe get some Cheryl's in there, G-Max Rapid Flow, and you're not playing all this dark stuff with the dark energy and the Moltres, and you get to be more consistent about just being Urshifu. And maybe that's where Urshifu finds its place again in the meta. Or maybe the, the Moltres build is just fine against Palkia and just it's not a, ever very, a very popular deck and everyone wants to play the new cards. So that's why we don't really see too much of it. As we're recording right now, the late night special is concluding they are in the finals right now still in game one it looks like in the two decks in the finals we've got a intellian palkia and then we've got a player who is 10 and 0 going into the finals 
with Reggie, Reggie Gigas. <laughs> <laughs> so, just thought that Reggie. could be some uh, some useful information out there for the people. Reggie Gigas. <laughs> We're gonna see one in cut. Just wait. I don't know. Yeah. Do you have any other decks you want to talk about before we close it out, Azul? I mean, I guess the only thing I would mention, like, Ice Rider fell off. Kind of, uh, it's just gone. And that's it. It was really hype going into the format. It was very popular, doing well as well. You know, second place at the full grip tournament. Um, only losing to one of its rougher matchups in Mew, and then, or losing in the finals to one of its rougher matchups. I think it could have lost to another, uh, another matchup. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Ice Rider kind of disappeared. That was that felt a little bit weird, but maybe it just kind of makes sense. Maybe Paul Kidd, once again, too much to handle because that was that's one of the matchups that was like oh ice rider's good against palkia right yeah but and it would theoretically if that is a good matchup then i feel like ice rider should be performing a little bit better but we just don't see it it's just not i mean one of the problems with ice rider's always been the inconsistency so maybe the ice rider's just kind of cooked from here on out we just won't see it anymore three prize cards maybe is one part of it too being more three prize cards not a not a good thing not a good look right now yeah not the not the uh the best thing trading into two prizes that also have a bunch of hp so yeah. Well, I think that is going to do it for this week's episode. One of our longer episodes. So I appreciate everyone for sticking with us through it. If you did enjoy, please leave a rating on your favorite podcasting platform. Or if you're watching on the YouTube channel, be sure to leave a like down below and subscribe to the channel. Really would appreciate it. It helps us out a bunch. Let's us know that you're enjoying the content. Be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel if you are listening and also follow us over on Twitter. You can follow myself at Trainer Chip. You can follow Azul at Azul underscore GG. And you can also, of course, follow the podcast at Uncommon underscore Energy. Thanks, as always, guys, for the support. Any closing thoughts, Azul, before we close it out? No, that's it for me. Best of luck if you're playing in Milwaukee this weekend. And if you want some of the dice, uh, the custom uh, Uncommon Energy dice, just find me or Chip at some point throughout the event. And we Guaranteed to hit heads on your crushing hammers every <laughs> single time. <laughs> and your Pokemon catcher. <laughs> That's not true. I should should That's... clarify. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, before, be sure to scout one of us out. Say what's up. Ask for a die. We'll have them on us. We won't have endless of them, but I don't like, think we're going to run out. So we'll probably have one for you. Just uh, come, up, come up and say what's up. And um, yeah, have a good... Uh, we'll see you back next Tuesday, 7, uh, 7 a.m. See ya. Peace.